our Lent lecture series, um, our last couple of speakers um, have been very international. We've had the perspective on Wesley from North Carolina, and we've had all sorts of perspectives from Ghana uh, um, uh, last time from, the, uh, from our friend Kofi. Well, since they were international, um, obviously uh, we sort of welcomed them in a particular way. Well, tonight, I barely need to welcome our guest at all because he's very much more local and we're very glad to have Bob Blenko with us tonight who's going to talk um, on the topic Amazing Grace. And earlier today I asked him and I said, how shall I introduce you and how shall I introduce the topic? And he said, Amazing Grace, that's it. So there you go. Um, because Bob is local and uh, very much knows the way, ways of our church, I'm not going to come back at the end as we normally do. I'm not going to conclude uh, the session today. I'm going to leave that in Bob's capable hands. Um, but it does mean that I'm going to just remind you that uh, we have a Lent lecture this time next week, to which you are very welcome to join us. Uh, which I believe, here we go, week five, Chantel Burley, Transitions UK. Chantel, next week, um, and uh, so that's there for you to see. And also, just to say that the collection um, today uh, that we are taking is for the Wall of Answered Prayer. So um, those are my only two notes for this evening. Uh, Bob, if you'd like to come and join us, it is tradition, of course, that we, um, that we pray together uh, for the beginning of the lecture. Sorry, I'm taking over the lectern. Um, but it, it's, it's lovely. Thank you for doing this. Okay. And let's just take a moment to okay. offer up your word to, yeah. to God. Let okay. us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the insights that we are gaining through these Lent lectures. Particularly tonight, we are grateful for Bob's presence and all that he gives to our church and all the work that he does here. We thank you for his gifts as a speaker and preacher. We thank you for his sense of humour. So Lord God, help us to be open, help us to hear what it is you're saying to us through Bob and look after Bob as he tackles amazing grace this evening. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This evening, I'm going to talk about a gift. So I thought what I'd do is I would offer each one of you a gift to start off with. <laughs> and please don't leave any papers on the seats. It's a bit different way of doing a communion, this, isn't it? You may eat them if you want. Of course, if you've given up chocolate for Lent, you'll have to save them. I just want you to remember how you feel when you're having received a small gift. the lectern in a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry about all of you online. Um, I can't email gifts at the moment or gifts of chocolate, but there we go. mechanic who worked out of his home had a pet dog named Mace. Mace had a bad habit of eating the grass on the mechanic's front lawn. So the mechanic had to keep Mace locked up in the back garden. 
The grass on the front lawn eventually became overgrown. One day the mechanic was working on the car on his drive. He dropped a wrench and it fell into the long grass. He searched through the grass but he couldn't find it. By now it was dark so he decided to call it a day. That night Mace, the pet dog, escaped from the back garden and went to what was the front lawn and ate the long grass. The next morning, the mechanic went outside and there he saw his wrench on the front lawn. Realizing what had happened, the mechanic looked up into the sky and proclaimed, a grazing mace, how sweet the hound that saved a wrench for me. <laughs> Putting the two words together, amazing grace, we probably automatically think of that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, which we will come to later. First of all, unlike the other speakers, people leading the le le lectures, I'm not an expert. I'm certainly not an expert on grace. This evening isn't a Bible study. It's a talk that I hope will stimulate our thinking about grace. Grace, in particular, God's grace, God's amazing grace. Why did I offer to do a talk on grace? Well, that's, that's a good question. My answer when Jenny suggested we do another series of Lent lectures around what is on your heart, well, something within me said, why not share my thoughts about grace? So you see, it's just something I don't think we talk enough about and let alone share with others. You, of course, may disagree. Regardless of where we find us, find yourself, ourselves, on your spiritual journey, I hope my talk this evening will lead each of us into a more robust appreciation of God's grace and how it applies to our own circumstances. At the end of my talk, I don't propose we have a question and answer session. I'm not sure how it's going to end. It will end, but I'm not sure how it will end. Anyway, we'll come on to that, uh, we'll come on to that later. In October 2007, at my local preacher's recognition service, some of you I think were there, I gave my testimony. And as part of my testimony, I played a song written and sung by Neil Diamond. He wasn't here, we just had a CD. And the song was called Pretty Amazing Grace. It's a song that for me, particularly at that time, meant so much and actually still does. And, and I take these particular lines from the song. Stumbled inside the doorway of your chapel, humbled in God by everything I found, beauty and love surround me, Freed from what I fear, ask for amazing grace, and you appear. For me, the words of the song were so true after a broken relationship with God, I too stumble in a, inside a chapel. So what is grace, and in particular, God's grace? I remember at the start of the COVID pandemic, do you remember two years ago now? When we, were, when we had to go into isolation and Andrew and his family started to stream services online via Facebook and YouTube. There was quite a lot of discussion took place at our worship team meetings about the language and words we use in church. 
as we, are break, as we were breaking walls down, as it were, and taking our worship directly into people's homes, we needed to make sure the words we used were available to all. We use so many church words that we take for granted. And yet those on the outside, this, a lot of these words may be confusing or even meaningless. Grace is a word that is used in a number of different ways, both in church and outside of church. You may say grace before a meal, a short prayer thanking God for the food you're about to eat. At school for certain meals, we would say for what we're about to receive, may God help us. At home, in recognition of my wife's, Leslie's, amazing meals, we have amazing grace. At the end of the service, we may say, let's share the grace together. It may be used as a closing prayer at the end of a service. In church, we may have sung amazing grace. We may have heard some talk, someone talk about God's amazing grace. In the secular world, the word grace is used in a number of different ways. Grace can be used as additional or extra time to make payment. Payment is due, but I gave her or him an extra week's grace to make the payment. Grace can, be, can describe a quality of movement the grace of which, I'm not going to do this leap, but the grace of a ballerina leaps into the air, she leaps into the air. It can be used to address your royalty, your grace. I address my mother in this way. If you're listening, mother, mother, your grace. We also talk about social graces. He or she may have had the good grace to say, I'm sorry. Parliament declares an act of grace to pardon a criminal. There's also something called a grace note, which I just don't understand in music. And in Liverpool, there are three magnificent buildings on the waterfront of the River Mersey. They are known as the Three Graces, the Royal Liverpool Building, the Cunard Building, and the Port of Liverpool Building. These magnificent buildings were constructed in the early 20th century as symbols of Liverpool's international prestige, proud emblems of its commercial prowess. Now, as much as I like talking about buildings, and in particular the construction methods that we used, I want to share my thoughts or some thoughts with you this evening on the grace of God. Even the, Bible, even the writers in the Bible used the word grace in a number of different ways. Properly speaking, that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, charm, sweetness and loveliness, goodwill, loving kindness, mercy, and the kindness of a master to a slave. Excuse me a minute. A number of the apostles' letters include the word grace at the start and at the end of their letters. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We come across the word grace many times in our Sunday worship. It's easy to say, easy to sing, to hear the word, but what does God's grace really mean? I wanted you to understand it, not from a theological point of view, but how does it, and how should it affect me? How does it affect my relationship with God? How does it affect my worship? How does it affect my prayer life? The Apostle Paul 
describes the benefits of receiving God's grace in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. Into this grace which we now stand. Once again, I turn to some words from a, a secular song written and sung by Stormzy. And I'll choose some words, some lines from his song. I'm blinded by your grace, by your grace. I'm blinded by your grace. I'm blinded by your... Sorry, I'm not singing it, but I'm just saying the words. <laughs> I'm blinded by your grace. Lord... I've been broken. Although I'm not worthy, you fixed me. I'm blinded by your grace. You came and you saved me. Lord, I've been broken. Although I'm not worthy, you fixed me. Even though we are not worthy, we're offered grace by God. Defining grace can be as simple as one sentence of declaration. Grace is the favor shown by God to us all and is available to us all, whether we're seated in here or whether we're driving up and down the road outside, God's grace is available to all. And that's what the words of the song written by Stormzy say. John Stott wrote, Grace is God loving, God stooping, God coming to the rescue, God giving himself generous, generously in and through Jesus Christ. And in her book, um, Sin Boldly, Kathleen Felsini compares the concepts of justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you absolutely don't deserve. It's the unearned unearnable, if that's a, such a word, it's the unearnable gift. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began by eliminating possibilities, incarnation. Other religions had different versions of God appearing in human form. Resurrection. Again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about, he asked and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's, what was unique to Christianity among other world's religions. C.S. Lewis said, that's easy. His response was, it's grace. So come on then, I hear you say, let's have some real encounters of God's grace. In February 2018, Leslie and I went on an amazing holiday. It was when we could go on holidays, although I'd understand now holidays are beginning to open up. We went on a river cruise on the Mekong. We visited both Cambodia and Vietnam. On Saturday the 10th of February, we were in Phnom Penh and we visited what had been 
the Khmer Rouge Detention Center. It was known as S-21. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge forcibly took over the cities and towns in Cambodia. And over a period of 1,364 days, were responsible for killing two million Cambodians. Teachers, government workers, journalists, anyone who was educated was killed. Anyone who was wearing glasses was killed. Many of them were taken to this detention center, S21. As these events were being described to us, I couldn't get over the fact that this had all happened in a short period in the 1970s. And this would never happen today, would it? S21 was known by the local people as the place where people go but never come out of. More than 14,000 people, I'm told, entered, but only seven are known to have survived. One of the top Khmer Rouge in charge of S21 was a man called Comrade Dutch. Just hang on to that name, Comrade Dutch. At this time in Cambodia, there was a young man called Lapel. He escaped from the Khmer Rouge and ended up in Thailand. And he became a Christian and moved to America, where he became a pastor. After the war, he made regular visits to Cambodia. In 1994, Lapel and a team from his congregation bought some land in Cambodia and built a church. A year later, he returned to conduct a team leadership course, training among 100 local Christians. One of the leaders invited was a school teacher by the name of Hang Pin. To cut on a very long story short, Hang Pin was converted to the Christian faith. He was baptized by Lapel and he became a local pastor in Cambodia. Over time, Lapel and Hang Pin lost track of each other. That was until an American reporter called Hang Pin one day and explained he had been doing some research into the Khmer Rouge and discovered that someone by the name of Dutch as one of the hierarchy of S21 was responsible for the deaths of many Cambodians. The reporter described Dutch to Lapel. He had big ears and a sharp nose. He had the same features as Hang Pin. Hang Pin, again, there's a long story behind all of this, but Hang Pin, Dutch as we know him, confessed to his crimes and gave himself to the authorities and was eventually put into, was eventually put on trial for the United Nations. He's now locked up in prison in Phnom Penh for the rest of his life. When Hang Pin is in Cambodia, which he visits regularly, he visits Dutch in Phnom Penh prison. He said Dutch is joyful, he is peaceful, yet he carries the weight of his crimes. But he's thankful for God's grace and he shares God's grace with the other prisoners and the prison guards. In 1987, an IRA bomb buried Gordon Wilson and his daughter below five feet of rubble. Gordon survived. His daughter was tragically killed. Gordon Wilson forgave those who'd set the bomb off. He said of the bombers, I bear them no grudge. I pray tonight and every night that God 
will forgive them. I pray that God's grace will forgive them for what they've done. We come across these, I'll call them giant stories of faith, and we think that nothing like this ever happens to us. But in preparing the material for tonight, for this talk on grace, I came across the following. Sorry, my mouth's going dry. Oh. I'm not bent down too much. In pre yes, in preparing my, uh, the material for my, for my talk, I came across this, the following. There was a question asking, where are you right now on your spiritual journey? It had a scale from one to ten, with one being, I've never received God's grace, to five, I'm not sure I've received God's grace, to 10, I'm confident that I've received God's grace. And I wondered how each one of us might have responded to this this evening. When I first saw that this, I wasn't really too sure about it because I believe that God's grace is available to all at all times. Some of you may be aware that I struggle with my hearing. Leslie certainly does. Her voice is always there, but there are times when I don't always hear it. <laughs> and I wonder if this is the same with God's grace. It's always there, but we just don't recognize it. Over the next couple of days, or maybe even later tonight, maybe you just sit down with a mug of tea, glass of wine, whatever you prefer, and just think about your own life. You may be surprised. Yes, I believe it was God's grace that helped me through caring for that person. Yes, it was God's grace. It may be God's grace that I had an answer to a prayer. Yes, it was God's grace that really helped me. And you might find you're at a higher end of the scale than when you, that you originally thought. But when you think of these things, just remember to say thank you. Not in a churchy way, but in a heartfelt way. Eugene O'Neill, an American playwright, said that man is born broken and the grace of God is glue. Man is born broken and the grace of God is glue. I think that's pretty true. It's divine glue, of course. He goes on to say, I experience its buoyancy as a very strange calm in the midst of tremendous anxiety and loss. I often get my sense of humor back or I just feel safe in God's care when I recognize God's grace. Again, for me, this is a sense of God's grace that I have experienced. Some years ago, when both my daughters, Ali and Kath, had left home and they were away at university, none of them continued, neither of them continued with attending church when they left home. I started to beat myself up. Was it me? Had I put them off? When they were young, I was very involved with leading youth groups at the church on, on a Friday night and a Sunday night evening, or Sunday evening. Had I spent more time with other young people than my own family, I had a real, a, a real feeling of guilt. 
It was during a series of talks on the Lord's Prayer at Easter people in Torquay that I felt God clearly say to me, don't worry, they'll be all right. Afterwards, I felt such a relief, such a relief. If you want further evidence of God's grace, I would suggest you go onto the website for the eternal wall of answered prayer. And you will see some amazing stories of God answering prayer. Page after page of prayers that have been answered. Not happening 2,000 years ago, but happening in 2020. 2021, 2022, God's grace is visible through these answered prayers. Coming closer to home, if ever there was a project that received God's grace, I believe this place we're sitting in is it. If we backtrack through the challenges that were faced from the conception of the project to completion, the issues faced with five church communities coming together into one, the failure of the first part of the plan to move into the town centre location, which failed because a developer went into administration, the legal challenges that we faced or were faced with selling the various church buildings, agreeing on the location of a new building. For a period, we were like a nomadic church without a fixed address. Then, during the construction of this place, as Dorothy will know, when we had times of no activity taking place on this site. The, con the contractor went into administration and because of this there were significant financial implications. But here we are today, one community in a building that's being paid for. How's this been achieved? Well, as someone who's spent many years in the construction, I believe this place has been achieved through prayer and in response to prayer through God's grace. So why not share the story of this building with those you know? Because to me, it certainly demonstrates God's grace. We even had a speaker here who was proclaiming the toilets in this building. And why was he proclaiming the toilets in this building? Because he was a granddad, and he'd been in the toilets outside, and he'd seen the small toilet that was provided for children. And he said we should be shouting that from the hilltops. So God's grace is there to be shared. 1 Peter verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in the various forms. In Acts chapter 11, news had reached those disciples who were being persecuted in Jerusalem that good things were happening in Antioch. A great number of people believed and turned to to God. Barnabas was sent to Antioch to see what was happening. When Barnabas arrived in Antioch, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord. I feel with, in our worship, 
and I make a generalization here, I think we need to raise the profile of God's amazing grace. I enjoy a cup of tea, but what makes it really special for me is when I have a biscuit with that cup of tea. And boy, is that good. I enjoy worship, but what makes it special for me is when God's amazing grace is evident in our worship. When we show how God's amazing grace impacts on our lives in the way Barnabas was encouraged when he saw what was happening in Antioch. I, for one, would like to see more evidence of God's amazing grace in our worship. Earlier today, I came across this from Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our songs, our tongues were songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord, through his grace, had done great things for those in exile. The Lord had done great things, and we are all filled with joy. Surely if, as C.S. Lewis said, it is the one thing that differentiates Christianity from through other religions, let's embrace grace in our worship and show our thanks for what God does for us. I said at the beginning that I wasn't too sure how we were going to finish tonight. I handed out small gifts to you all. Maybe you were a bit surprised by receiving a gift. You did say thank you behind your scars, muffled thank you. I think we have to say thank you to God for his grace to us. I also referred earlier to a hymn the hymn Amazing Grace. This hymn was written by an Anglican clergyman named John Newton. It's probably one of the most popular hymns today. It's sung and played in both religious and secular settings. John Newton wrote the words from personal experience. He grew up without any particular religious conviction, but his life experiences led him to the point where he was ordained in the Church of England, where he became a curate in Olney, Buckinghamshire. John Newton was conscripted into the Royal Navy. After leaving service, he became involved in the Atlantic slave trade. In 1748, one night on a violent storm, battered his ship so violently off the shore of County Donegal in Ireland, he cried out to God in mercy. And this was the start of his spiritual conversion. But he continued in the slave trading until 1754 when he ended his seafaring career. He then started to study theology and eventually became a slave abolitionist. He was then ordained in 1764. Amazing Grace was written to illustrate a sermon. There you go, Andrew. If you want to illustrate one of your sermons, write a hymn. So he wrote Amazing Grace for a New Year's Day in 1773. The underlying message of the hymn is that forgiveness and redemption are possible regardless of the sins committed. 
and that the soul can be delivered through God's mercy, through God's amazing grace. Through God's amazing grace that is available to all. If only we would just listen, open our ears and listen. I'm hoping that we can put up God's or amazing grace up there. I don't know if you're in voice, in good voice, but would you like to try and sing it? Would you like to have a go at singing it? Right, okay. So if you want to stand, and uh, we'll have a go at singing it. Anybody want to start it? Amazing grace. Just pray together if you can. Let's just take a moment and think of how God's grace has impacted on your life.
Gracious God, we thank you for your amazing grace. For your love as we are, despite all our faults and weaknesses. For your grace which is available to all of us. We praise you that you accept us, not through our own efforts or according to our own deserving, but through faith in Christ. Would you forgive us for not recognizing your grace in our lives? Would you give each of us a longing to serve you better and to grow in the likeness of Christ, not in any attempt to justify ourselves, but simply simply to express our love and our gratitude for your grace. And would you fill each one of us with your spirit and encourage each one to share your grace, your amazing grace. Amen. Thank you and good night.